Okay. Um, so let's see where we're at on our schedule. Um, if there's any uh, questions or concerns or anything, just send a, put it in a chat um, and our TAs will take a look at it and either get back to you right away or they'll interrupt me and I'll um, talk about whatever it is. Um, so let's see, today we, a um, couple of things that I wanna do. Um, I'll begin uh, looking at homework four. There's a couple of things that I wanna say about homework four. And um, then we're gonna go back and talk a bit more about TCP congestion control. I have uh, uh, some TCP dump traces that I wanna go through and those were made using the, our example TCP program, that TCP send program. Um, and so let me, Start out by looking at homework four. Okay, so <clears throat> the one point I wanted to make was this question three. Um, I don't know how many of you have um, taken a look at it or started it or tried to do it. Um, what I was going to do was uh, to use Netflix and to obtain a TCP dump trace of a uh, Netflix uh, movie that I would watch and analyze that. Um, if I'm, I'm assuming that many of you have access to, to Netflix and so um, if you would like to um, do Netflix because then if you get results, you can maybe send me the results or we'll share them. I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, see uh, what the, basically the broadband access capabilities are at different locations across the state, right? So you're all in different places. And I think it would be interesting um, to compare um, what we all find in terms of, of how Netflix behaves um, in different locations across the state. So um, I was gonna uh, make a video that basically shows how I went about answering this question. So it'll demonstrate or illustrate uh, establishing a Netflix session and um, using TCP dump and some analysis tools uh, to answer these questions. And um, so I'll try and make that available by tomorrow. Um, and then the next thing I wanted to point out in, um, so our example code TCP send. Um, so let's take a look at that um, real quick here. Okay, and so what we're, the two windows, what we're looking at. Um, da -da -da -da. So the top window is actually from our UDP Echo version three. So, you know, it's a completely different program from our TCP send program, right? So UDP echo is basically just a ping type program. 
but I wanted to uh, point out, find the send, the actual call to send in both the, the UDP example and in our TCP send example. So let me get back to that. Okay, so um, the top window here, so this is the client of the UDP echo. And so again, you know, it's in the middle of a loop and each iteration it's issuing a send to and it's passing the socket descriptor, a pointer to a buffer containing data. Message size is the amount of data. And then the server um, address information. And the return, num bytes, is going to be either negative one, which would indicate an error, um, or it will be zero or greater than zero, indicating how much data was actually sent. Um, and it usually should be message size. Okay, so that is the send to with a UDP socket. And now looking at the send with a TCP socket. So, so again, this is the TCP sender. And so we're in the middle of the loop where you know, its purpose in life is just to send data as fast as it can. Um, so on each send, the parameters are the socket file descriptor, a pointer to a buffer holding the data, and the amount of data. And so first thing, and then the return coming back is either going to be a negative one or the number of bytes actually sent. Okay, so the first thing to notice is with the UDP case, notice that the server address is um, our parameters to the send to. And with the send, uh, we don't have, have those parameters. So, can somebody explain to me why that is the case? How come we don't see the send, basically the server's address on this send call? And if you think you know the answer, unmute and chirp out an answer. Just take a guess. Anybody? All right. I'm going to pick on somebody. Sorry. All right. Um, Someone said it in the chat. Oh, what's that? Someone said it in the chat. Oh, thank you. Okay. Okay, so it was taken care of in the three-way handshake prior to sending. Yeah, that's basically correct. So the when the TCP code does the connect, that basically um, attaches or assigns the server address to the socket endpoint. So the information is, is there. So that's why we, we don't have the, we don't have to specify the server address. In UDP, we could actually issue a connect call in the client code. And that then we could use a send and 
because a connect call would basically accomplish the same thing from a program perspective. Um, it would associate the server's address with the socket endpoint. Okay. Um, what's it if we were to issue a connect with the UDP socket? So in our UDP echo program, what what's the difference between that connect and the TCP connect? And someone go ahead and take a guess and put it in a chat. So what's the difference between if our UDP program issues a connect versus our TCP program when the client issues a connect? And the answer is sort of in Jeff's previous post. Anybody want to take a guess? What doesn't happen in the UDP connect? Correct. Right. So the, the difference would be with UDP, if we issued a connect, there would not be that three-way handshake. While when we do that in over a TCP socket, that connect initiates that three-way handshake. Okay. Um, all right, so that, that was good. Let me go back to question four here. So basically I'm asking you some uh, questions related to um, the TCP send code. Uh, and let me sort of talk through what I had in mind when I was um, asking these questions. So the in the TCP send, so the client is, the program is TCP TX and the there's uh, several parameters. One is the data size, the next is the chunk size, and then the next is the pipe size. Okay, so the, um, let's see, the, think of it this way. I'm actually going to see if I can use my iPad. So that I can draw. Oh. Give me one second here. Okay, so I think I've joined. Cancel. And All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my laptop and try to share my iPad. All 
All right. Okay, so All right, so we were talking about the TCP send program and uh, so the TCP TX and the parameters are the server name and the port and the data size chunk size and pipe size okay and so as an example, let's say that we have at the sending side, let's say that we have um, a gigabyte of data to send. So the data size is a gigabyte. And so you know, just imagine that there's a big old buffer that is one gigabyte large and our code so in the sending code it's going to be a while loop and it's going to send i'm not going to show all the parameters but a chunk size of data at a at a time and so we have a pointer called tx buff buffer pointer which is initialized to point to the beginning of our data um, and what we're doing is we're looping and issuing a send um, going through the one gigabyte of data in piecemeal. So in a, a size of chunk size at a time. And so we're um, TX, Maybe the better way to draw this is there's another buffer which represents the chunk size of data that we're going to send. And so we're each send is sending the first chunk, and then we're updating the TX buffer pointer. plus equal chunk size so that the next time we send, we're going to be sending the next chunk size. And so that's the purpose of that parameter chunk size is it gives us something to um, tune the um, the sending process with. And so the question that I'm asking on that last question on the homework uh, is what do you think would happen in terms of performance if the chunk size, um, which by default is a megabyte, if we reduced it to something like a thousand bytes. And so, you know, the answer is that as we reduce that
that chunk size, it increases the number of times that we have to loop, okay, which increases the overhead of the program. And so by having a large chunk size, we transfer you know, that chunk size amount of data into the TCP transport layer. And then it breaks up that chunk size of data into segments and TCP does its thing in terms of sending those segments um, interacting with the its peer at the other end. Um, so, but if we if we have chunk size too large, then we have the potential of buffering issues. So, um, let me see if I can erase. All right, so remember with our, oops, with our socket, if this is the send side, this is the RX side. Um, so we're talking about at the, um, the API, the socket API level, the send, and we're talking about the amount of data to transfer each invocation, right? It's effectively a performance issue. And so we call that chunk, chunk size. Um, <clears throat> associated with the socket, as we've talked about, is a socket TX buffer. Okay, which, and there's also a RX buffer, which really doesn't come into play at the sending side, but at the receiving side, the socket RX buffer does come into play. And so, you know, the stream of packets will enter that Rx buffer and um, potentially fill it, depending on how fast the uh, TCP, TCP Rx program does reads from that buffer. And so at the receive side, we also have a parameter called chunk size and pipe size. Okay, so by default, the at the receiver, the chunk size is also a megabyte of data, but we can set it to something small or large. Um, and the same trade-off occurs if the chunk size gets small, then the, uh, the receiver becomes inefficient. Okay. Um, the pipe size parameter at, for both the server and the receiver, that is going to, the program is going to change the size of the socket TX buffer and RX buffer to whatever value you set. Okay, so like if you run the code, you would see that the, the current setting of that TX buffer might be like 250 K bytes, something like that. And the setting at the Rx side might be something similar, 250 K bytes. So
So we could do an experiment where we set the pipe size to something very small, like a thousand bytes, and we'd see um, we'd see v the throughput drop very, very low. So TCP um, is is more complicated than than UDP because it could do more. So with TCP, we're typically interested in sort of maximizing throughput. And so issues like how your code loops and you know the, the details and how it it issues a send are important. And the details of the socket buffers are also important. All right, so let me see if I can get back to stop and share. All right. Okay. Uh, everybody with me still? How about just to make sure everybody do a thumbs up to, if you're with me? Thumbs up, thumbs up. All right, good. Okay, so that was sort of what I was after with that first set of questions related to the TCP sender. Um, the, t the next set of questions related to the receiver. Okay, so this will take a little bit of thinking on your part to have this make sense. Um, if you look at the other TCP example that we've we started with, that's TCP echo. The server forked a child process. In fact, let's take a look at that. Sorry, I don't understand. Oops, that was my Google Android phone. I must have said something. Uh, all right. TCP echo. Okay, so TCP echo is not as complicated as um, the UDP echo version three, right? So we started with the equivalent to TCP echo, that was UDP echo, and then made UDP echo version two, and then that led to version three, and that was basically the first half of our class. Uh, looking at the very first TCP echo program that we started looking at, which comes straight from the Donahue textbook, um, Okay, so, th and again, this is the server side. So by the time we hit this for loop, we've created the socket and we call accept and we're gonna block there until uh, a client arrives. And when we unblock, we're uh, gonna be past the client socket so this i talked about this before this is the sort of the mind-blowing part of how tcp works so a tcp server will effectively fork a new socket to deal with a new client connection and so that's why a server goes sort of hand in hand with forking a child process to handle the new client. 
Okay, and so that's exactly what TCP echo does. All right, so we, uh, on the return from the accept, we haven't yet forked the child. So this is still running on the, the uh, parent's context, but we now have a new, we, so there's now two socket descriptors. There's the parent's sock descriptor, and then there's this new one, um, that is associated with this new client that has just um, been established. So we fork a child process. So that's the fork call. And the return from the fork gives us three possible states. One is an error occurred. Two is it, we're running in the child process context. Or three, we're running in the parents process context. Again, a mind blowing thing, right? So after the fork, effectively the parent process cloned itself. There's now two processes that are identical. And we'll call the original the parent and the new one the child. We know, and, and the code is identical, right? So the, the, each process is set, its code segment is set up exactly the same. So they're gonna be running the identical code and so the way to differentiate, to have the code differentiate if it's the child or the parent is by looking at the process ID the, or the return from the fork. If it's zero, then it, we're running in the child's context. Okay, and so we close the parent server sock socket because the this child process is only going to interact with the new uh, client sock it will never need that serve sock so it closes it then it calls handle tcp client passing the client sock and then that code interacts with the TCP echo client code. And once it's done, the child exits and goes away. Then here, if it's not an error or pr process ID is not z zero, that means that the process ID is greater or equal or greater than zero. And the return is actually going to be the process ID of the child process. We, so the parent closes the client socket because it no longer needs it. It's forked a child process to do that work with the client sock. And it just loops back and blocks in the accept waiting for the next client. So this design is called a, a concurrent server, which means that, so the easiest way to explain this is, imagine if all of a sudden 100 clients tried to connect with this server, so a single instance of this server program running, 100 clients, connect at exactly the same time. Okay, so basically what happens in, to, to make this brief, the, all of those connections will um, go through first the three-way handshake, and then once they complete the three-way handshake, they, are placed, the connection, 
the state of the connection at the server is placed in the accept queue. And so, you know, depending on timing, um, the, the server is going to be carrying out the three-way handshake with all 100 clients at the same time. Okay, and so, but eventually all 100 three-way handshakes finish and they get placed in the accept queue. And so this for loop basically will loop through 100 times and fork 100 processes, child processes. So if the handle TCP connection uh, client takes a long time, then we would see that there are 100 client uh, child processes, each handling one of those 100 um, clients. So that's concurrent server design. The back to our TCP send program. Okay, so the, and we're looking at the server side and to make a long story short, this is not a concurrent server. It is called an iterative server, which means that the there's no child process forked. And, you know, let's say that a client, well, let's say that the same scenario, 100 TCP senders, so 100 clients of this program hit this server at the same time, okay? So as with our TCP echo discussion, the 100 clients would interact with the TCP um, transport layer on this host, on our server host, and carry out the three-way handshake concurrently. So the three-way handshake is being done all um, 100 at a time, eventually 100 will be moved into the accept queue. Okay, so this code is actually going to process each of those 100 clients sequentially. Okay, and so, you know, imagine if each um, interaction with a client between the client and the server requires, you know, five minutes or so. So now imagine the 100th client that's at the tail end of that, in that accept queue has to wait, you know, if each client takes five minutes, has to wait 100 or 99 times 100 or five minutes before it gets served. Okay, so again, another design issue with, um, that, that primarily is oriented towards TCP servers. Okay, so I hope that sort of made sense. Um, and let's see, let me, so that, that, that was the point of these questions there. All right, so <clears throat> I'll have, Lecture notes 415. So this is going to be filled out with a bunch of questions that will be related to 
the material that I'll probably just be able to start here um, and I'd like to be able to show the TCP traces. Not sure if I'm going to have time. Let me jump into this. So this is our tcp.pdf that we've been talking about. I added some pages towards the end to help me better talk about uh, congestion control. So all of this is the same. We've been through through this. Okay, so I think the, so we talked about the acknowledgement strategy and, and that's basically, um, there's choices depending on the protocol and let's, Let's also skip this slide on congestion avoidance because I think I put too much material in too few slides and it makes it confusing. So what I tried to do with the new slides here is take a step back and let's just start out with terminology. Okay, so the, the terms that we have been using or will be using, slow start, congestion avoidance, fast retransmission, fast recovery. So those are the four components of TCP's congestion control algorithm. Slow start, you know, when you think of slow start, think of the variable congestion window and the purpose of slow start is to get move the connection to the knee and I, I'm going to skip forward here for a second because I now have a picture where I can show you what the knee means. So these graphs are sort of the classic graphs you would see in a networking book where that's talking about congestion control. As on the x-axis, the load to the network increases. So number of users on the internet increases. The throughput would be sort of the total throughput the network is able to deal with. And we see that as long as the load is low, there, the throughput grows linearly with the load as it should. So there's no problems. All the traffic is being taken care of by the network. At some point it reaches the capacity. Okay, so we'll say that you know, this line roughly up here, that's the absolute maximum throughput this, the network can support. And the problem is we can still have senders trying to send more and more data or you know, another way to think of it is more and more new users of the internet start you know, join. And so the load grows, the throughput plateaus and then it reaches a point where it collapses. So that is called col congestion collapse. What TCP tries to do is oscillate in this area. So the knee is right here. Okay, so TCP tries to, to operate in the knee. Slow start is the, is the algorithm that you know, with each ACK that arrives back at the center, the sender, it increments the congestion window by one. So it grows the sending rate 
exponentially. In fact, every round trip time, it doubles the sending rate. So the purpose of slow start is to find the knee. So TCP slow start wants to produce packet loss because that marks the window size where the knee might begin. So long story short, what when packet loss is detected, the there's a variable called SS thresh, which is set to half the congestion window value. So basically the per the idea is SS thresh marks roughly the beginning of the knee. Okay, and and we'll see the TCP operates in sort of two modes when it's the, when the congestion window is below SS thresh, it's in slow start, growing the sending rate exponentially. When the congestion window is greater than or equal to SS thresh, it slows down its growth and it increments the congestion window one by one over the congestion window, which if we roughly what that means is it incre increments or increases the congestion window by one every round trip time. So it'll, it, it allows slower growth in the knee. Eventually loss should happen, which takes it back to you know, an area around here, but the behavior is to oscillate around the knee. So that's the objective of all four components Oops, I don't want to do that. Of all four components of um, TCP's congestion control algorithm. Okay, and so I try to do a better job of talking about that in these updated slides. Um, and again, the chapter three, I think it's section five, does an even better job of talking about this. Um, so I, I think I'll, I'll leave this to you to look at. So make sure that you look over the rest of these slides and Next time, we'll go through this example together. So um, basically, all right, so in the next 30 seconds, I'll just introduce this. So I used the TCP send program and this uh, client was on one Linux machine here at my house, the server on another Linux machine. Um, and I transferred, I told the client to transfer 10,000 bytes and I obtained a TCP trace. Okay, it turns out that I added artificial latency and loss over the path. So there's, um, the RTT is roughly 60 milliseconds. The loss rate is roughly 5% because I wanted to capture a packet loss event. So in the first attempt, transfer, running the program, transferring 10,000 bytes, no packet loss occurred. And so, you know, as you look at this, lines one, two, three represent the three-way handshake. Line four is, uh, is the first data segment um, from our client. And in fact, we'll see 10,000 bytes being sent and X being sent in response. And you can see like the flags 
when an F is in the flags, that means that this, no, this host issued a close. So it finished and we could then see the second host complete its connection teardown and issue a close and that's the end of the connection. Then this next example is a bit more interesting. One segment is dropped and so we see an example of, of uh, duplicate acts. So you see here the receiver sends ACK 1449, 2897, 5793, 5793, 5793, 5793. That means 5793 was, was dropped. So, and also that we, this represents the third duplicate ACK. And so we will see the sender retransmit and the connection is able to complete the transfer. So um, take a look at, at these examples because they're very helpful in you know, helping you understand how TCP works. All right, so sorry I took a couple minutes uh, extra of your time and uh, we'll continue with this. Um, Monday. So, sorry, continue with this Friday. All right, have a good couple of days. Talk to you later.